Hello everyone, good afternoon and welcome to the Shine Her Light webinar. So we organized this virtual meetup as a way to crown the Shine Her Light writing contest. The contest began 8th of March and will end this Sunday, 31st of March. And so far, we are very happy with the number of participants. Just that, unfortunately, our target audience for the contest, which is female participants, we couldn't reach that target. As at now, we just have about 30% of participants which are female. But that's OK. It is an improvement from our usual numbers. So we're still glad with that number. And Going into our session for today, we have three speakers from diverse fields of work. First off, we have Adwa Tenkrama from City FM or City TV. And secondly, we have Stephanie Nkansa from Arusha, Ghana, a climate change um, directed NGO. And then finally, we have our own executive director from Open Foundation West Africa, Jael Sewa Boatin. Okay, so we'll zoom right in into the first session. Um, Adjo, are you ready? Yes, yes, I'm ready. I'm ready when okay, you are. that's awesome. So we opened the floor for you to take us away. All right. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Adjoa Tenkrama Domina. I don't know how many of you have heard my name before, but yeah, people find it difficult to pronounce the name. But yes, I'm Anna Chim girl from the eastern part of Ghana, and I'm pleased to be here. So first of all, I'd like to thank the Open Foundation for West Africa for this opportunity to be a part of this webinar. And in fact, it's a pleasure to be put among ladies who are actually doing amazing stuff in their own respect, you know, to advance the cause of women. So when Ruth, Ruth invited me for this virtual session, she said, and I will try and remember what she said. I don't want to quote verbatim, but she said, we're inviting women from various fields to speak on their challenges and also give encouragement to other women. Ruth, am I right? Yes, please, you are. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, when she said that, the obvious reaction for me, or my first obvious question I had to ask myself was that, are there any specific challenges in the media space where I work that I'll say that these challenges are peculiar to women and women alone? So it's, it's quite easy to, you know, say that the media job is simply demanding and it's for everybody, whether you're male or female. But when you go, you nuance the, the issues properly. Is that really the case? So are the challenges, what are the peculiarities we experience in these challenges? Are women treated a certain way in the media field just because of the gender they came with? You know, so the, I don't have answers to these questions immediately, but I hope that as we continue, um, we would maybe all find answers to the questions I've asked. So let's uh, move straight into our topic. Am I clear to go ahead? Yes, please zoom in. <laughs> okay, okay. So the topic I have, I mean, that's on the fly, is telling the untold story of the African woman. <laughs> the, the, the topic is quite loaded, but I believe that when it comes to telling the story of the African woman, 
many stories have already been told. So it's not essentially that or absolutely that we have not told the stories yet, but I believe that some of the stories have been told, but perhaps by the wrong people and in the wrong way. So maybe one of the questions we may want to be asking ourselves or take away from this webinar is who is telling the stories of the African woman and how are they telling those stories? I think you and all of us got it on this um, internet may have examples of the stories we have heard about women. There are positives and there are negatives, but which ones to precede the other? So to put our topic in perspective, I would like to read out um, excerpts of a book. It's written, it's written by Thomas Jing. He's an African writer and he's based in Canada. The book is titled... The Tale of an African Woman. So the excerpts I picked reads, please, I would like everybody to pay attention so that we can follow the story. I quote, The village of Yakiri has been cursed by ancestral wrath because of the treatment of Ya, the first girl who wrestled her male goat hair pierce to earn the right to be initiated into the society of manhood. Her struggle is taken up generations later by Yaya, who is the granddaughter of Tafan and Weba. Orphaned like her forebear, Yaya becomes a star student uh, in the village primary school and promises to go far. But ask, she asks the villagers, is it right to invest in an education for an African girl who may become the property of another village? Do we understand that question? I. Hi, everyone. Yes, we are listening. Okay, do, do we understand the question Yaya asks, please? Yes, <laughs> okay, please. so 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 Yaya is essentially asking that the defining role of a woman in society has been that you grow, you get married, so you move to another village, essentially. So is it right to invest in education of somebody, of an African girl, who may become the property of another village. That is by marrying, moving out to live among the kinsmen of a husband. That question was not answered, but the, the quote further goes on to say that an educated woman will abandon the farm where she is needed, wear high heels, and try to order men around. End of quote. So for me, when I read this excerpt, it was very interesting because I believe for a long time, this has been our definition of the equality we are trying to fight for. Many assume that once you are saying that a woman should be given equal rights as a man has, it means that she is going to take the naturally given, and naturally given is in quotes, naturally given authority of the man, and the man will rather become the woman, the woman will become the man. But it's not a blue or black affair. Okay. I, I believe that this book is, even though it's a work of fiction, actually, but we may all have examples of these things that we have accepted in society, but maybe, hey, wait, I think I have to set a timer. I have 15 minutes, right, Ruth? Hi, Ruth. Oh, I was speaking while I was muted, sorry. Yes, please. It's fine, I have 15 minutes. How many minutes have I done so far? Just so I stay in. in so time. far, you've done about eight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh wow. Yeah. Okay. We'll give you extra. We'll give you extra. Okay, please give me extra 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so um, as I was saying, I, I believe that quite, even though the book is, is a work of fiction, it's very relatable and we may all have examples of things that perhaps we have accepted in society, but maybe impeding the parts of women. So recently I sat in a vehicle and my driver was talking to somebody in the front seat and he said something about Professor Nana Jenopokwajima, how many of us know her? She's she's going to be the running mate to John Dramani Mahama, the NPP's uh, flag bearer for the 2024 elections. So the man said, and he said this in Chi, I don't know how many of us understand the Chi dialect, but I'll just paraphrase it in English. He said, I heard the NDC has made the same mistake again they made in 2020. So his his guest or the person sitting by him asks, what mistake is that? And he says, they are going to pick that woman again as running mate or partner to John Mahama. I don't think the NEC wants to come to power. And I was shocked, but I guess what was coming after that was more shocking because the man said, this woman you are going to pick. So if you become president, how would you groom her to become president after you? How would a woman become president in Ghana? He said that, and for a moment, I was frozen because I was like, this is 2024, and people still think that a woman cannot be anything she sets her mind to. And the, the way the other person agreed to the commentary presupposed that He's not the only one who has this sentiment or who owns this narrative in the country. So while I am first to agree that there has been progress in a journey of ensuring that women come up in the places of power, in the positions where they can take decisions, I think that the conversation they had for me was a realization. It dawned on me that there's still a long way for us to go. So, I mean, let me talk about the media space since I've been asked to talk about challenges in the media space. And for example, you'll find that across the media, when you pick all the big, big media houses, CT, Joy, TV3, um, which one again, GH1, or any other media house that you can think of, you'll find that women are being shown to, you know, being being given the chance, being given the opportunity to shine. So when you look at the primetime bulletins across all networks, I think all of them are being anchored by women. CTTV, CTFM, I am here, Joy FM, you, you see MFR Pau. I think when you go to GH1 or Star FM, you see Nande Day. When you go to TV3 or 3FM, you find um uh, one, one other lady, Bernice, Bernice or something. I, I've forgotten her name, but essentially you find that women are dominating the media space. But what really we may not be putting our minds to is the fact that the real positions of power where a decision can be made to affect women, women are not there. So when I when I say positions of power, I'm talking about the boardroom, I'm talking about um, the managing directors, I'm talking about people who host the actual shows that pull the numbers. When you look across board, you find that it is men who are still dominating. And I don't think that it is because the women have not shown enough capacity to handle these positions. Perhaps we are still warming up to the idea that a woman can be more than just a wife. Okay, so um, because of my time, I will just um, talk about one last person, Shelley Anita Shizom. I think recently there's a movie on Netflix called Shelley and essentially um, cataloging her biography. But Shelley was um, the first black woman to, to ever be selected or elected to Congress around the 1970s in the US. And at the time she joined, there were about just 10 blacks on the Congress. 10, meaning that she added to nine more men, making 10. Now, there were many times, Shelly, per the stories I've read, Shelly will come out of meetings with tears in her eyes, 
because the men in the room saw her unfit to be part of the table, but also importantly because the women who were in Congress thought that the place of the woman should be somewhere else rather than Congress, and especially a Black woman. And subconsciously, that narrative has taken seat in our minds so that even when a woman is running for power, we would rather support man. And it happens subconsciously. We, we may not even realize it is happening, but we feel inclined towards accepting the fact that a man is a naturally born leader. So one of the first things you may see when you Google Shelley's name is her quote that says that if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring your own folding chair. I think I have about two minutes to end. Bring your own folding chair. And what she's essentially saying is that when you decide to be a, a catalyst, I believe that's the right word, a catalyst for any change at all in society, or you decide that I'm going against this set of tradition, you also must be willing to accept every other challenge that come with it. So in 2016, Esla made certain comments about women who are running for office. She was talking about how men bullied them, men called them all sorts of names. And another, I was talking to a colleague and he made a comparison and said that, I mean, men also have people calling them names, so it's not special to women. But look at the power dynamics. First of all, how many women are even encouraged among their, their people to vie for position, even when they do, do they get that support? And that's why I believe a lot of um, groups have, women groups have been pushing for the passage of the affirmative action, bill, which has been sitting in parliament for God knows how long, but that is clearly not being done. I am first to admit that the fight for ensuring that the woman shines allowing the woman to shine and properly telling the African woman's story in a way that will change the narrative in a way that will re-engineer our minds will not be easy. And it's definitely not going to be handed over to us on a silver platter. You may, you may have disappointments and rejections along the way. You may be called all sorts of names. You may be, you may feel that even your own people are letting you down. By your own people, I mean women are letting you down. But doesn't mean you should give up. The answer is no for me. So as of January last year, the UN said that global participation rate of women in national level parliament is 26.3%. That is less than 30%. And that's abysmal. For how many years since we started fighting about ensuring that women are giving the space? And for me, you see, the thing is that people are not seeing what women bring to the table because the chance is not being given. Okay, when you say these things, people feel that you are over flogging the situation, but that is the reality on the ground. Okay, so I would always want to look at the stories behind the numbers and what the real issues we have managed, what, what we have managed essentially to achieve over the past years what we have left to be done and what we are willing to do to solve the issue. So in our own small ways, in our companies, are we employing more women? Are we giving slots to women? Are we saying that, we're not saying that employ somebody just because she holds the female genitalia. We are saying that there has been an injustice in the system for so long, but as we aim to correct, unless we're not willing to correct that, but if we do, can we not say that, okay, but the fact that you're a woman, you are entitled to enter this company. Gradually, we increase the numbers. Gradually, we groom people that can take over from the men that we so think that they are natural born leaders. But nobody really is a natural born leader, you know. So um, I'll conclude. Uh, I think I've exhausted my time. But um, I'll say one more thing, which is that... Um, over the years, I've been told to build myself. And last week, I was having a conversation with a colleague who was a male, but fortunately, he was he was agreeing to the injustice that happened in the media space towards women. 
And he said something very profound that I would like to share. He said that, Adra, build yourself, build your values so much that you cannot be overlooked in the room, no matter how hard anybody tries. And the story of Shelly I spoke about is just like this. Shelly built herself so that you cannot ignore the presence. From being a congresswoman, she pushed to become nominated for the presidential race. And that's not something you can play with. So while we continue to demand a seat at the table, I would just like to tell us or remind us to put in maximum efforts as women, okay? So that when we dare to be the best that we in whatever we do or wherever we find ourselves, I think that it won't take long for people to recognize that we deserve the seat. And now they will offer the seat to us. We don't have to beg for the seat. Thank you very much. Wow, Ajwa, that was wonderful and very insightful. Everyone else, I hope you have garnered something from Ajwa's short <laughs> dissertation. Was it short? <laughs> I think it was quite long. I think I exhausted oh, no. more than 15 minutes. <laughs> you managed the time quite well. Oh, I'm glad I did. Thank you. Okay, so for those who would like a bit of background about Ajwa, Ajwa is a broadcast journalist with CTFM and CTTV. She holds a bachelor's degree in communication studies at the Ghana Institute of Journalism, now University of Media, Arts and Communication. So I would say if you would like to see Ajwa, please turn on City Newsroom and yes, you see her on your television. <laughs> Moving Thank you very on. much for the free advert. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to our next speaker, we have Stephanie Nkansa from Arocha, Ghana. Stephanie is an environmental enthusiast with a keen interest in environmental education. She particularly focuses on youth and children, recognizing the important role that education plays in shaping attitudes and behaviors. Now, Stephanie believes that empowering young minds with the knowledge and values necessary for responsible environmental stewardship is key to building a more sustainable and harmonious future. Um, Stephanie, are you ready? Hi, hello, can you hear me? Yes, please, we can hear you. Excellent. Yes, I'm ready. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much for having me on this panel. Um, first, I want to say to Ajwa, well done with your presentation. Um, it was quite insightful, quite impactful, and I learned a lot coming, you know, with what you said. So um, thank you for sharing your perspectives. Um, so as um, it was stated, my name is Stephanie Kansa, and I am a project support officer with Arusha Ghana, which is an environmental NGO where we focus on climate action, youth involvement, and community liaison um, to be able to, you know, drive the, a, a more positive um, action when it comes to issues um, around environmental um, so situations or environmental degradation and so on. And with my side, uh, I got this invitation, this honored invitation to talk about the challenges um, personally, that I have been experienced or I have experienced um, when it comes to as a woman or an African woman, whether in you know my role or in every aspect and all and you know experiences that I've also um, gained. So I wouldn't take too much of your time, but I'll go straight into it. So uh, I would say, as a young person or young woman in within my field. It's it has there are lots of ups and there are lots of downs. So I will come from starting from my university times. I remember when I I've always had interest in environmental issues and especially when it comes to children as well. It's something that um, I grew up um, learning inwardly and also experiencing from certain women and persons such as David Attenborough or Wangari Matai, who is one of my heroes, and. Um, so I've always had an interest in environmental topics or environmental issues. And I remember when I was I was thinking about, you know, pursuing a subject in within environmental science or environmental studies. 
a lot of um, feedback I got was A, but you, this, what kind of work is this? First of all, first of all, it wasn't, I wasn't encouraged to go into that work. One, because um, they felt environmental issues are not something where um, it's popular, especially when you're looking at the monetary values of it. And um, and as a woman, you know, it's like, oh, why don't you go into more um, female roles? So like nursing or um, maybe teaching, which um, I'm not against, but, you know, it's sort of like more nurturing um, related roles, which, um, I mean, historically, it seems like they, you know, they say women are more geared towards. And um, I... You know, for some time I contemplated on it, but I felt, you know, I I sat down to myself, and this was something where I thought of where realized that there are not a lot of women, especially African women, when it comes to being key in key roles when it comes to environmental, um, you know, conservation or environmental change or environmental movement, you know, um, and so I felt, in, especially in Ghana, there was. This, it wasn't as much. I felt like the, it, there was some, there was a gap in that side. And so um, I thought to myself, you know what, let's, let's keep at it. Let's keep going. Let's, let's see what we can do, go to achieve. And um, so I went to the university. Um, it was not easy. I had some issues, um, even some with, you know, lecturers and all that, but um, I was able to come out of it and then to find uh, myself in my capacity, I realized that when we are, for example, in certain fields, especially when you're looking at um, those maybe within certain communities that sort of don't have a lot of privileges, you realize that the dynamics between the women and the men is quite vast and quite... Um, I don't want to use the word severe. Severe might be too much, but it, it's it's quite the gap is quite large. So, for example, in some communities um, where we we engage in, you see that maybe women are not allowed to come to the table when we are having a discussion. It's only the men, and then, for example, maybe the men and the women would have to ask permission from their husbands in order to be able to partake in some of the discussions maybe we want to do or the um, community engagements. And, you know, um, as, and sometimes you, I, there was instances where maybe we would want to talk to some of these communities and they wouldn't want to talk to me because I'm a woman. And um, it, it was quite an eye opener, you know, because I would say because maybe I'm in the city, um, it's, it's not as prevalent. You do get a little bit of, under you know underhands here and there, but you know I'm I'm you tough enough and you face it on. But when you go to um communities outside the city where there, you know there's not a lot of education or there's not a lot of um exposure to women's rights or women's equality, this is where you tend to see the disparity, and um you realize that a lot of these women are actually the ones doing the work or involved in most of the work, when it comes to maybe farming, um, taking care of the, the community of the home, you realize that a lot of them tend to be tended by the women. And um, it made me realize that there's still a long way to go uh, when it comes to in, encouraging the African woman to be able to say her opinions without being penalized or without being subject to scorn. And through, of course, um, we be able, we are able to, one of the ways we are, I try to do this is to build trust with the women and to be able to also even build trust with the, the men as well, to let them understand that I'm not just, a, a, you know, this Accra girl who has come, you know, with her strange ways and things, you know, this is not the way of the community and all that, but we try to let them understand the importance of how, you know, coming together to build a stronghold where the woman and the man, you know, the woman's um, thoughts and the woman's suggestions, the woman's contributions actually have weight. And because they tend to be on the ground and experience a lot of things or a lot of issues when it comes to environmental, um, you know, challenges or environmental um, impacts, then they should they should have, a, a, you know, a say. And so for me, I feel um, as an African woman, there's still a lot to do, um, especially within that sector. 
Um, and it's, 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 we try, we, you know, we're trying our best to always include the women, make sure that the women have that, that knowledge, again, in knowledge, again, in inclusion, again, in understanding. Um, I always say that it's not necessarily just about, um, representation, you know, because I feel sometimes people, because of, um, oh, now we have to do women inclusion, women empowerment, women this. So it feels like sometimes people are just in, adding women in just to fill the status quo. You know, they're just saying, oh, we just need women in just to to say, oh, we have women. No, you know, we are, we are, we have this percentage of women, see how well we are doing or see how inclusive um, we are. But I would always say that it's, again, it's not just about representation or just filling the status quo. It's about, you have to recognize and value the contributions, the perspectives and the voices of these women. And um, so that's where I'll come from. And when I talk, when of course with my experiences, um, we just want to encourage uh, women in all aspects. And especially again, when you're looking at maybe certain areas, you know, um, I have a passion for what I do. And so I always tell people that, you know, you should have a passion. Otherwise, it would just be another job, quote unquote. And you always have to also be manual, 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 meaning um, you have to learn how to adapt. And I think when women, most women are, are pretty adaptable. And so I will always encourage um, our women to learn how to be adaptable. You never know where you find yourself. Learn to be adaptable. Always learn to not back down on yourself or not look down on yourself, right? Um, it's quite easy to fall prey to people, what people say. And then they say, oh, because you're a woman, you can do this. Or because, or even as yourself, you feel like, oh no, because I'm a woman, I will not be able to do that. So I always say that, and this is where I give um, kudos to my parents because I feel that also has also helped me personally. My parents have always told me that you can do anything. You can do anything, you can achieve anything, just set your mind to it, just you know, keep at it. And so I want us to, to be able to do that, keep at it, be manual, be flexible, and always learn, always be able to learn, be, be open to learn, be open to explore, be open to um, understand, you know, people's differences, it, you know, things are different. It's not always the way you see it, you know. So just be open to changes, but then also understand that if you have something to bring to the table, don't let your voice be silenced. Um, bring it to the table. Sometimes you have to stomp it on the table for people to hear you. But if it's able to get your voice heard, I don't see why you shouldn't do that. So I think I can end on that note. Well, everyone, we would have a question and answer session after all the speakers have spoken. So if you have any questions, any additions, any even about the contest, please note them down. We'd have a separate question and answer session for the contest and then a separate one for speakers. So you can divide your questions as to which category they fall into. And yes, thank you so much, Stephanie, for the encouragement and sharing your experiences. Now, our final speaker for this afternoon session is our very own Tayel Sewa Boatin, Executive Director from Open Foundation West Africa. <laughs> Zael, are you ready? Thank you. So um, as Ruth said, I'm the team lead here at Open Foundation West Africa. Um, um, my forte is actually HR. So um, I recently graduated. So congratulations to me <laughs> I'm from the Common Kuma University of Science and Technology with an MSc in Management and HR Strategy. Um, I've been with OFWA for the past one year. Yeah, so I'm also a newbie, as I like to say, just as some um, people on here who may now be navigating your way through Wikipedia and Wikipedia stuff. Don't worry, you have a partner in me. Okay, all right. So I would like to say thank you to Stephanie, thank you to Atra. Um for your talks. Um, I think that um, as a woman myself, I have to congratulate you um, for 
all that you've been able to achieve in your field so far. So thank you for being here as well. All right. So um, I think that Stephanie and Natra have said much. And um, I would have just a little to say. Stephanie mentioned affirmative action. Honestly, I think that that is just a camouflage. You know, um, people say that um, they are in affirmative action. Okay, fine, we are fighting for this number of people to get into parliament, this number of people to get here and all of that. To what end? Is it just to fill the numbers, just to check your boxes and say that, okay, um, we need this number of people to, you know, make the proportional rights, and then you get that number and that's it. What efforts do you put into it? Some just want to fill spaces they, because there are other women as well who can do great jobs but are not allowed to do it, especially when they hit the limits they think um, they need to achieve whatever target they've, um, they've set for themselves. We have a president who is a gender activist, as he calls himself. And yet in his parliament, we have the lowest number of people. We have 14.5% of seats going to women in Ghana. And you look at his political party, you look at how strong the women are, how vocal they are, how hardworking the women are. And yet most of them are not given opportunities like this you know in places where women are are supposed to be given the chance to run on a post they are rather fought and taken off the seats and there are men who have occupied these seats haven't done anything they've done virtually nothing but these people are the ones that the, the parties fight to keep on the seats, they are the ones that go on a pause. It, it doesn't make sense, honestly. So when you keep talking about affirmative action, what are you talking about? Is it that you just want to check your boxes and know that, okay, yeah, um, I'll be held for this. I've been able to do this at least. Um, we had eight women, I've made it nine, so yeah, I've done better. Is that what they are doing? That's actually what they are doing. They just want to check boxes. It doesn't work. For me, I feel like we should be progressing at the state where we are now. This shouldn't be a topic for discussion at all, but it still is. Why? Because there is a challenge. And they will tell us women to, oh, better yourselves. Um, I, 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 I was talking about it. Better yourself. Take advantage of opportunities. Do this. There are so many women who have same qualifications with men, but they are overlooked. Why? Because naturally, as a woman, when you come into the corporate field, you are disadvantaged. You would. It comes to a point where you may not be told explicitly, but you are being asked to choose between family or work. All right. When you give birth, for instance, I'm a new mom, so I can speak about this. When you give birth, there are so many organizations that men are given just five days, um, at most 10 days or something, paternity leave. Meanwhile, we keep saying that, okay, parenting is a shared approach, um, I'm sorry, shared responsibility, but they are given just five or 10 days. Why? Because it is assumed that the men do not have much role to play when it comes to this. It is the role of the woman. Meanwhile, the longer the woman stays at home, virtually she is at risk of losing her job. There are, as it stands now in 2024, there are organizations where you give birth, go home, and your seats or your role um, could not, I, 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 I would say that it would be hanging, it would be at risk because by the time you come, there would already be someone to replace you. I have a practical example. I used to work in a company 
um, I was treated very well there. I, I cannot lie about that. But there's a fundamental problem that I noticed that um, I, I saw employees, I saw a woman give birth, go home. She wasn't told that, okay, you cannot come back after childbirth. And so all along she's thinking, I can come back after childbirth. And now her leave is almost up. Discussions around coming back um, starts. So we start these discussions, and that's when she realizes that no, you cannot come back. So actually, the money you were given that you thought was um, 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 was to you know just support you for your childbirth or something wasn't. It was actually to say goodbye. And. In this generation, this shouldn't be happening because now she has a child and when she she goes into a new company, she goes for an interview and all of that, and she's going to be asked these questions as well. You know, when a man comes into an interview, nobody asks him, are you married? Do you have a child? Because they feel that this has no relation to the work that he's going to do. It has no impediment. But for a woman, you'll be asked these questions because we feel it can affect the work you do. Why? These are all limitations against women moving up that ladder. And we may think that we are not, um, we are not inhibiting women but subconsciously this is what you are doing because you're asking these questions and then the woman goes back home ask herself okay so what do i do do i choose this or do i choose that and so you go into various homes now there are so many women with a lot of degrees whatever so many qualifications but our home and of course, they are doing good things by, by going into their own businesses, setting up their shops and all of that. But ask yourself, is this what they really wanted to do? Maybe they, they would have wished to have still been in the corporate world, but they are not in there now. Why? Because of situations they found her, themselves in. Because they probably got married, because they probably gave birth. But these things do not happen to men. It, it doesn't. Men do not have these challenges. And, and so I will encourage or I would implore all our guys that have joined this webinar to, to rid yourselves of this mentality. It shouldn't go on. We keep talking about it. We keep talking about it. But what happens? We start campaigns around this. These are all just actions that are taken in futility because if we keep doing all of these things, we keep um, spending resources on this campaign and yet we get still come back to this problem, then we are not really doing anything, you know. But I feel that this shouldn't stop us as women rather it should serve as a motivation to do better to go higher of course we know that we would have to to do more than a month in order to prove yourself and so you would have to because this is the situation we find ourselves in right now if we do not do better and get to these positions of power where we can influence the next generation, then our children will grow, also give birth, and from generation to generation, this will still be a topic up for discussion. I feel like we are so disadvantaged at, at, at so many things, but this is our time to also act. All right now, we are being given opportunities. We are, we, we are hosting this contest, Shine Hair Light contest. We are writing about women because there are not enough articles about women, especially the African woman. And we've said explicitly that females are encouraged to join this. 
And here we are at this webinar. Where are the females? Where are they? All right. If we don't take advantage of opportunities, then this topic will never cease coming up because from time to time, we'll always have this problem. And so if you are a man here and you do not want to be in another webinar like this um, from in 10 years, in the next 20 years, where you, your child may be complaining to you about being disadvantaged, then it is up to you to also encourage the women around you to take advantage of opportunities. How many women have you introduced to Wikipedia? How many women have you talked to about bettering themselves? You know, we all have to do it because if we do not do that, then this topic will just keep coming up and coming up and coming up. I wish that the next time we meet like this, it wouldn't just be about complaints, but we will be discussing actions that we have taken. We will be discussing results of the um, actions that we've taken. And then we won't still be at the points we are now. So my dear woman, I know there are not a lot of women here, but if there is any lady joining, I want you to encourage yourself if you have no encouragement. Do better. Fight for whatever you deserve because it will not come to you on a silver platter. Also, most of the challenges we face are not just on the surface as we see them. If we want real change, then we should be targeting the laws. We should be targeting the laws because if these laws do not favor us, then there's nothing we can do about it. Any employer can do anything they want to do to you and hide behind the law. So what change do we expect to see regarding women? Whatever change we expect to see, we should be fighting for laws around these things. Because if we do not do that, then anybody at all can do whatever they want. At the end of the day, we will, it, would, it would be up to the person's conscience. Not everyone has a good conscience. Not everyone feels bad about sucking a woman because she gave birth, about um, giving a woman's role to someone, uh, or about not promoting a woman even though she deserves it, just because we feel that. Her, her children or whatever would be an impediment to her growth. We should be targeting laws. That's what we should be doing. So I think that this is what we should take up, that henceforth we do not just talk. We should target the real issues, and this real issue is the law because Anybody at all can do something to you and hide behind the law. If we do not do anything about it, then we'll still end up complaining. I'm looking forward to a day or a time where the woman is not forced, I say forced in court, to choose between um, her career and her family, where the woman can seem to have it all she will be free to give birth and care for her children and still gain promotion at work. If this can happen, we also need systems to work because, of course, employers, they're only thinking about the profit they are making. And so if they feel like, okay, as you are home, you will not be able to make profit because your work will be stalled. What are the systems that need to be put in place to make sure that even as your homework will go on? These are the things I'm talking about. So we should target it from the roots, all right? Now women are being encouraged to go into STEM. It should happen because when you go into STEM, when there are lots of women in STEM, they can develop technologies that can help women. We should take advantage of the opportunities we are getting now. I'm not happy at all 
that for a shine hair light conference, a shine hair light contest, sorry, we have more men than women. I'm not happy at all. I'm looking forward to a time that when we have contests like this, we don't have to create a category just for women, just to award a woman. No, I'm looking forward to a time that it will be an actual competition between the men and the women, and whoever deserves to win, wins. Because we have a contest, and we have to create a separate category for a woman, because oh, we presume that hmm, it may happen that the first three, there would be no woman. It's not right. Then our fight is in futility, because if we keep fighting for women, and these women keep letting us down, then it doesn't happen. That's why I'm saying that we are facing this challenge. Okay, Ruth, I know my time is up. I'll be ending soon. We are facing this challenge because those who started spoke and spoke and spoke and spoke, and people did not take advantage of opportunities. And we are where we are now. So as we are speaking, it shouldn't just be about speeches. If you're a lady here and you're listening, you have a great opportunity in this movement, especially because you're a woman. Just as you are disadvantaged in so many things because you're a woman, here you have an opportunity because we want more women. Take advantage of it. Don't sleep. And encourage more women to also join. If we do not take steps, actionable steps, this conversation will never end and we will never have progress. So as I end, I would like to re-echo what Adra said again, that as a woman, you need to better yourself so that if you are sidelined, everybody would know that you actually deserve this, but you have been sidelined. If you do not better yourself and you sit where you are, then of course, many opportunities may pass you by. So do not just stay there take advantage of opportunities better yourself and be confident have confidence in yourself as a woman you are capable you can do it do not ever be late for yourself you are capable of doing it and so you can thank you wonderful 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 okay that's is the end of the speaking session so with all of what our speakers have said if you have any questions directed to either speaker kindly bring them up now whether in the chats or you can unmute yourself and then bring up the question okay daniel okay thank you very much Please, am I audible? Yes, you are. Hello. Okay, so um, I would like to make some views for what I've seen so far um, pertaining to uh, this uh, women, women empowerment um, uh, activities we do and we think. Especially for what I've realized is that um, most women or some ladies I know see themselves in a glass ceiling as if uh, they, they, they assume they can get to top heights, to be executives, to be CEOs, to be like something great in the near future. But here lies the case. Uh, they, they, they see some barriers or yeah, there are some barriers which prevents them from being that of a sort. And I've seen that um, from all the speakers, those barriers has been addressed. But <clears throat> the barriers, we've, we've all seen the challenges or the barriers, but yet still we face uh, uh, difficult in bringing women on board for some special or unique activities. Because I've seen it to be um, some sort of motivation or 
they, they haven't conscientized themselves to fit into those positions. It's like uh, they don't want it. Uh, yeah, they don't want it. That is why there is um, gender equality and um, inequalities from SDG goal five and SDG goal 10. Here lies the case, the goal 10 will assign some resources to weak people like women in the society, pave ways for them, but the women are not there to fix it into those positions. So uh, I'm sure women, some, some of them are not conscientized yet. Yes, not conscientized yet to be fixed into um, certain portfolios in our societies. So it's high time for them to gather some momentum to be fixing those positions. Thank you very much. And thank you, Daniel. Please, any more questions or suggestions? Okay, Zilin. Um, good afternoon to you all, and then thank you for the presentations. Um, I don't know whether when we talk about women empowerment, um, should we be focusing to some particular areas or it should be general, like comparing to the activities of men? Um, for instance, um, some time ago, I've checked about these women empowerment things and I've seen that if we were to put men and then women in some situations like sports, maybe the person who ran the fastest person or the best, uh, in terms of weight lifting and other stuff, you see that if they were to be put together, um, the men would have outweighed the women. And then if you are to put them together for the purpose of equality, we'll see that you will have a whole lot of men before women come in next. But when we look at other things like um, um, technology, let's say cybersecurity, um, just learning coding and then other stuff, which is just not about um, exerting physical energy, women are able to perform similar to the men. So I don't know whether if we are talking about women empowerment, should we be comparing them head to head to men, or we should be focusing on some particular areas where men and women can perform um, at the same levels? I just need them to touch on that for me. Okay, I think Stephanie's hand is up. Stephanie, would you like to address that? Yes, hi. Uh, thank you, Abdul, for your um, your question. Now, this is a question that tends to come up when we're talking about um, gender equality. Now, when we are talking about women empowerment, I, now let me speak from my personal um, side. Now, there, there are obviously um, some limitations, especially when it comes to, like you were talking about the physical aspects. Now, realistically, realistically, if you're looking at certain things like certain sports, if you're putting women against men in a certain category, like you said, that has to do with booth strength. Obviously, because of genetics and because of biology, a woman might not be able to outpace a man in certain categories or certain aspects. There might be some anomalies, but generally, um, I would say that that doesn't happen. So, so this is why you have women's sports and you have male sports. Now, when we want to encourage or empower our women in whichever lane she chooses to pursue or in whichever lane she wants to um, go for, we say we don't want you, we don't want you to be limited by maybe um, your what your self doubt. We don't want you to be limited by. Um, you know, external forces where people are saying just because you're a woman, you can't do it. Now we want to, we want things to be realistic. There's a difference between realism and then there's a difference between encouraging someone to achieve what they want to achieve. Um, so of course, when it comes to certain areas, we know that because of, again, biology and all of that, a woman might not be able to achieve that certain rank of a man. And that's okay. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But if she's doing something within, let's say, a female sport, of course, then you empower her to be the best amongst um, the, the females that she's competing against in that category. Um, again, this is, this is what I believe, and this is my personal opinion. So when it comes to things of intellect, intellect is a bit different than, say, physical boot strength. Intellect is where you are, um, you are either born with it, and then you, you, know, you learn, you adapt, you, you obtain. And this is where you see 
um, sometimes women or, you know, coming over against me because intellect is a bit different. So I always say that you can do whatever, you can achieve whatever it is you want to achieve, um, you know, but you have to be realistic. You have to give them the reality of it, but don't down, down them down to just say, just because of maybe one or two realities, they can't achieve whatever it is they want to achieve. If um, that makes any sense. Abdul, I don't know, Abdul, does that make, am I, did that come across for you? Yes, exactly. Okay, great thing. Okay, so any more questions about the session we've had? Or any more questions directed to any speaker? Daniel again? Okay, Daniel. Hello, Daniel. Hello. Yes, please. Hello. Okay, so my question is, uh, whilst we are um, highly in depth speaking about um, women empowerment and encouraging women to fix certain position, to come on board and what have you, don't you think it will get to uh, a time or a period whereby the table will turn? Now, it's, it's, it has to be men empowerment, men empowerment. What do you think? <laughs> I would say let's cross that bridge once we get there. <laughs> um, Stephanie, would you like to say anything? Yes, that was <laughs> and that was actually quite fun. And you know what? I always um again I'm speaking from my uh personal perspective. I mean, my other panelists may have different opinions, but um, the 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 thing is with women empowerment. Women, I always say, women empowerment doesn't mean exclusion of the opposite sex right because i think once we start to do that it be, it 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 can toll a line of where there can be resentment where there can be um a sort of like a this is our time now and so shunning of the opposite sex and all of that so i i i, I try to make people understand that Yes, we understand that women have gone through a lot. There's no denying about that. We understand that. But in some cases, too, in certain areas, we can also talk about how men also go through a lot in some certain areas or in some, when it comes to some certain things. However, I always say that when it comes to women empowerment, women empowerment inc means inclusion of men into the space to understand where we're coming from, letting them understand where it is we want to go and how they can help us get there. Right. And so I I always try to say that being woman empowerment does shouldn't be man bashing or man uh, exclusion or man trying to get over the men. It doesn't work both ways. Same way. Um, there are some men who understand that women are very good in this capacity and they give anybody the chance. If once you are able to fill that role, do your work and, you know, whether you're a man or woman doesn't matter. You are, you are brought to the table. So we have to find that good, that balance, that niche balance of letting women understand that they also have a say, but just because we've given you that power doesn't mean you have to override everyone else, right? It's like how we talk about now we have to listen to the children. Children or youth have to be included. Youth also have to be included, okay? So just because we are older doesn't mean that once we don't give the opportunity for the youth to also have their say. It has to be a nice balance. It has to be a harmonious balance where everyone comes to the table, where we try to push each other to the top. It's a ladder. So we have to try and push each other to the top. And then, of course, if more women are, are, are given that opportunity and voices to be able to come out, I mean, why not? But again, I would say it's not to put down the opposite sex. The opposite sex should be those who are stubborn, who think that is, a, you know, those the stubborn ones, maybe they may need some re-education and you know talking to and you know enlightenment but it doesn't mean that we just put them down to the side because it's a, the world is our balance you need both men and women to be able to push forward in this world so that's personally for me is what i would say okay thank you stephanie and i see giles hand is also up i would like us to take rosie's question then if Zayel, you'd like to add anything, then you just add it with all these questions. Okay. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. 
Um, what I would want, what I would want to say is that um, I don't think there should be uh, equality. I don't believe in equality. I believe in equity. We can never be equal. I mean, God created everything differently. So men and women can never be equal. We are human beings, but God created us differently. Now, what I would say is equity. Everyone should be given, I mean, same opportunities for them to thrive in whichever way or um, whichever profession they find themselves. They should be give, given uh, the resources that will help push them up. Saying you want equality, it's, it's a bit, to me, it doesn't make sense. Excuse my language, excuse my language. It's, it's not right for us to say equality. Or the fingers are not the same. God created these beautiful fingers differently. But what we need is equity. From my perspective, we all need, I mean, women need equity to be treated fairly. If I'm doing a job of a man, I should be paid the wages that a man would be paid. I shouldn't be paid lesser because I'm not a man. I shouldn't be given lesser resources because I'm a woman. If I'm in this field, I should be given the same resources that a man will get in order to build his or her profession and whatever they need. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Rosie. We'll take the last question about the session from Yalsuba, then I would give an announcement concerning the contest. Then if there are any more questions on the contest, we'll take those too. Okay, Yao. Yeah, hello. Um, okay, so my, my question is just about the, the contest. Um, I was a bit confused with like um, maybe writing of the articles or translations. I just wanted to know um, if there are some specific rules governing the contest so that I won't like be doing maybe a wrong thing or something. Uh, okay, so we'll take those questions after I give the announcement. Um, Dial had something to add. Okay, so um, Daniel, I think I just wanted to touch on what you said, and then Rosie spoke very well. I think what's happening is that we just want to bridge a gap, all right? Nobody is saying that the woman should um, be uplifted where, when um, the man is belittled, no. We realize there is a gap. We are just trying to bridge the gap. And so it's not going to take anything away from the man. Just as Rosie said, we are looking at a time where when both the man and the woman is qualified, the woman will not be disregarded based on her biology, just because she is a woman or based on something that, that will impede her just because she is a woman. But then they would both be given the opportunity to prove themselves, all right? Like Ziblin said, there are some things that require, um, require physical, um, physical strength that the woman may not be able to do in comparison with the man. But things that require intellect, things like this, the woman should not, there should not be a stereotype against the woman when it comes to stuff like that. But these things are happening. All right, I'm looking forward to a day where um, we go into a meeting, heads of institutions are meeting. I walk in there as the ED of Open Foundation West Africa, and people do not murmur and ask themselves, is this this woman? Especially when you are young. It, it is worse when you are young, all right? P people praise young men for achieving stuff, for getting to statuses like this. But a young woman, if you are not lucky, they could even say, excuse my language, you slept your way through to the top. This is the thing we are trying to fight. These are the things we are trying to fight. And it's not just 
in the corporate world. It's all around us. So if we do not tackle it from there, then it won't happen. I remember while I was in the university, I was in Pensa, and then we went um, to one village for a crusade or something. In my group, I, I, I don't know if I should say luckily or unluckily, we're only females, we're four of us, we're taken to a church. The moment this elder saw us, the first question was, Ah, imagine in a church and a whole leader of a congregation passes this comment. Just imagine, all right? We were able to execute our tax so well that at the end of the day, he came to us and said, I'm quoting his direct words. I have never forgotten this because this was the last place I expected to see something like this. You know, these are the things we are fighting. So we are not saying that we want the woman to take up all the positions while the men work be, um, beneath the woman all the time. No, we are saying that we want to bridge the gap. We, we just want men and women to be given equal opportunities based on their intellect, based um, on their capacity. That's what we are asking. And this is what I encourage you to also fight for. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jael, our panel of speakers, and everyone that has stayed with us till now. Now, I would move into the announcements about the contest. And before that, shared with you is our Connect With Us page. You see our social media handles. Please do well to follow so that you receive updates on whatever information we have concerning the contest. The third option with the blue bubble gummy looking icon is LinkedIn, if you can't see that clearly. Okay, so about the contest, it ends on Sunday, meaning the dashboard would be closed by Sunday, 11.59 p.m. And the selection of winners, we would put a call to the community and select a jury that would go through contributions made by registered participants. And I would say this, and I would repeat this, please, if you have participated in the contest, do not apply for the call to the jury. If you participated in the contest, do not apply for the call to the jury, or else all your contributions will be made void. So long as you apply, your contributions will be made void. And whether or not you are accepted, everything you've done will be basically zero. So please do not apply to the jury if you participated. The jury would go through contributions made and winners will be selected by end of April. We have taken your details in the Google form registration. So you would contact you and get your account details if you are selected as a winner and then the prizes should be dispersed. Okay, so about Yao's question on contributions to be made, basically any articles written, articles written on women, women achievements, women institutions, women's activities in society, prominent women, generally anything about women, whether African, even though we stated African, whether or not the woman is African, your contribution would be accepted. Yes. So translations also along the same line. So here I will take any more questions about the contest. Then we can go on with the closing. Any questions about the contest? Okay, Rahel. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please. Um, I wanted accent. Uh, have the have we already started the competition? Because I don't, I can't really tell. Because I've not done any. I want to know: Have we started, or we are starting today? The contest, the writing contest, started eighth March. That was International Women's Day. We opened the contest that day, and it will end on Sunday. So from now till Sunday, I think there would be some space for you to edit if you haven't already. Are you in any of our WhatsApp groups? Yes. 
Yes, right. so with the reminders we sent today, the link to the Google form and the link to the meta page of the contest is there. You can sign up today and then begin contributing. Once you sign up on the meta page, you'll be automatically added to the dashboard and we will track your contributions. This is that lucky. Okay? Please, lastly, can I ask this one? Um, since I have not contributed, can I apply for the other facilitators? To be part of the jury? Yes. Yes. Yes, you can. Please, where can I get the form? Oh, we, are yet, to, we are yet to put out the forms. So it will be sent to the WhatsApp groups. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Daniel, you also had your hand up. Yeah, yes, please, but it has been resolved. Okay, okay. So on that note, we would bring this meeting to an end. Thank you very much for staying with us throughout. <laughs> and enjoy the rest of Women's History Month. Goodbye. Time.